the guest we have on today's show, Abraham Kmark, has put his product in 1,200 Walmart stores, 320 Sprouts grocery stores, and many other retailers that you would know. And he joins us today to share how he did it and how you can too. You're going to hear no so much. And uh, people are going to be telling you that you can't do it. You're going to to deal with the pettiest, stupidest thing constantly that are people just screwing up. You're going to deal with investors who are asking all kinds of ridiculous questions and, you know, questioning everything about you. And you need to be able to just put up with a lot of that stuff. Um, You need to be able to, like, check your ego at the door and just kind of keep coming at it. So um, you can't let little things get upset on today's show he also shares how to find the time to start a successful startup business while managing the demands of having a family why you should keep your day job while starting a startup business why you must be prepared to give away a ton of free product to wow retailers he explains why he wakes up at 4 50 in the morning every day he explains how to find product creation partners known as co-packers the importance of following up with retailers, and how to get your product in stores. All this and more on today's edition of the Thrive Time Show. Get ready to enter the Thrive Time Show. We started from the bottom, now we here. We started from the bottom, and we'll show you how to get here. We started from the bottom, now we here. We started from the bottom, now we here. We started from the bottom, now we're on the top. Teaching you the systems to get what we got. Cutting Dixon's on the hooks. I break down the books, Z's bringing some wisdom and the good looks. As the father of five, that's why I'm a dive. So if you see my wife and kids, please tell them hi. It's the C and Z up on your radio. And now three, two, one, here we go. We started from the bottom, now we here. from the bottom, and we show you how Yes, 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 and yes. Thrive Nation, if you love Sriracha, this is the show that you got to watch. Ya. Abraham, welcome on to the Thrive Time Show. How are you, sir? Excellent. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Hey, you are a man who is uh, changing the food landscape in many ways. You're the founder of True Made Foods. Tell, tell us about this company, True Made Foods. So we've tackled uh, some of the worst junk food in your refrigerator. Most people don't know this, but the ketchup, barbecue sauce, sriracha, uh, all of them have more sugar per ounce than ice cream. No. Uh, it's worse than putting it. Yeah. Worse than putting a chocolate chip cookie on your uh, burger or on your burrito or whatever you're using it for. Um, it's basically probably the worst source of uh, sugar out there that's very hidden. People don't think they're using a lot of it, but you are. Um, if an average family goes through a bottle of ketchup a month, they're eating equivalent of about 150 donuts a year in sugar, uh, which is about a donut every other day, basically. So. So what you're looking at, um, and ketchup is the uh, barbecue sauce is usually the worst. You're looking at, you know, typically barbecue sauce like sweet baby rays has more sugar than soda. Um, so it's basically corn syrup, it's very thick, right? Um, where sugar, soda is watered down. Sriracha is the next biggest offender, and then ketchup, um, all of them more sugar per ounce than ice cream. So worse than a dessert in every sense. Um, <clears throat> and what we've done at True Made Foods is we've gone back to more natural way of cooking, uh, more something that the way people used to cook back before sugar and corn syrup were and everything. And that's it. We use veggies, uh, veggies and fruits to naturally sweeten everything. And we use purees. So we're not using a juice. We're not using a powder. We're using a puree. So that means you're getting all the fiber and nutrients um, from the uh, carrots and butternut squash and other uh, fruits and vegetables that we put into these products. Um, but the best part is it tastes fantastic. Like it really, really tastes good. Uh, we wouldn't try to sell it. I wouldn't try to sell it if it didn't pass a five-year-old test. And uh, you know that's the key thing. Is I'm, so I'm a dad with four kids, and that's the reason I got into this. Is because I was once a starry-eyed parent, thinking that you know my kids weren't going to eat sugar, and they definitely weren't going to eat ketchup. And I failed, obviously, miserably at that. Like uh, you try having an argument with a five-year-old over ketchup, and you're going to lose. So and every parent has that, that push point where they're like, okay, I can argue about the ketchup or I can just let them get them to eat their dinner. And if the ketchup gets them to eat the dinner, then that's fine. 
And the problem is, is of course, that they're, with the regular ketchup, like I said, they're pouring sugar all over their food right there. So it's kind of a lose-lose for the parents. So that's why I kind of invented Terminate Foods and started doing these natural ketchups made with just veggies. We started with the low sugar ketchup where we cut the sugar in half and now we have a no added sugar ketchup. So it's no added sugar whatsoever. It's like all pure whole minimally processed ingredients. Um, but the best part is like my kids can't tell the difference. Um, and most kids can't tell the difference between our ketchup and a regular ketchup. And our barbecue sauce is incredible too. It's really on point. We've partnered with a pit master at Mitchell who is probably one of the greatest pit master in America. Um, he's a legend out of North Carolina, <clears throat> about to open up a new barbecue restaurant down in Raleigh. And he's, uh, we put his face on all our barbecue sauces because he is in love with what we were doing. And uh, so we started taking his barbecue recipes too and, you know, making them healthier. And so we have these very healthy, amazing, and incredibly authentic ketchup and barbecue recipes and a fantastic uh, sriracha, which we call verracha with a V because it's just all veggies. So it's vegetable sriracha. Um, <clears throat> that's kind of what we do in a nutshell. Uh, so I, everything we do, everything we sell passes the five-year-old test because they're the most honest theaters out there, right? So I um, have a lot of clients I work with in the health and fitness space, and they always talk about how uh, Gary Tobbs produced a book called Why We Get Fat, and essentially that sugar causes people to gain weight. That's, that's the end of the day. Sugar causes so if somebody out there is on a lean diet right now, right, and they're just eating nothing but lean grilled chicken sandwiches, but they're putting some barbecue sauce on there, are you saying that that's the equivalent of having like a uh, a lean sandwich and then putting like a candy bar on the side of it or on, or on top of it? Yeah, or at least a chocolate chip cookie. I mean, you're you're basically ruining everything you're trying to do right there. Um, oh. Yeah, and that's why it, it's so hard to – in today's world to, you know, to eat a healthy diet because of these sauces, these hidden things, especially if you go out to eat anywhere. Say you go get a barbecue burger um, at your local burger place and you're, you think you're eating some healthy grass-fed or, you know, plant-based burger, and <clears throat> the bar- barbecue sauce with the pouring all over it, I mean, nine times out of ten, it's either Cattleman's Ranch brand or Sweet Baby Ray, both of which have 16 grams of sugar per tablespoon. Uh, sorry, for two tablespoons, so eight grams of sugar per tablespoon, which means if they're putting a tablespoon of it on your burger, you're getting eight grams of sugar. Uh, a typical chocolate chocolate chip cookie, a home-baked chocolate chip cookie, has three grams of sugar. So just do the math there on how much you're getting. You, uh, let's say right now, if you have just absolutely freaked us out, you, you know three-quarters of our listeners are like, Frick, I've been eating grilled chicken breasts and barbecue sauce for years ah where can they buy your stuff if they want to you know start having sugar-free stuff and Devin, let's let's buy some right now using our amazon account if it's possible where, where can we buy these things there brother abraham well you can definitely find it on amazon if you go to amazon.com backslash true made foods you can find all our products there which would be fantastic and if you use the uh the code uh, gratitude 25 gratitude all caps 25, you can get a uh, 25% discount from there, too, um, on anything we sell on Amazon. And then also, uh, of course, if you want to go to a store, um, it's, uh, you should get a better price in the store. And see, we're in Sprouts. Um, our low sugar ketchup is in Walmart. Um, and then we're on the East Coast and uh, a lot of different stores, uh, you know, Giant, Food, Stop and Shop, um, ShopRite, Wagmans, and, uh, you know, Safeway places like that. Uh, by this time next year, or hopefully just in a few months, within in 2020, we should be in a lot more stores, including Kroger, um, Safeway on the West Coast, Raleigh on the West Coast, and other places like that. So uh, did, did, did your wife come up with the idea for this, or did you come up with the idea for this? Who, where did the idea for this healthy, w- w- when did the idea come about to make this healthy, sugar-free uh, uh, you know, ketchup and sauce and that kind of thing? Well, ironically, somebody who was actually incredibly, who was actually incredibly unhealthy gave me the idea. Um, I, I had known this guy, and he was actually my co-founder briefly when we first started the company. He, uh, <clears throat> he had tried putting vegetables in ketchup before because uh, his wife had tried hiding vegetables in his food and things like that. Um, the problem is neither one of them knew how to cook, and they, the products they were making were awful. Um, but... 
when he told me about it, it was like a flash of lightning went across. Uh, you know, uh, it was a complete flash of lightning, complete fireworks for me because I, it was the exact solution to a problem I've been fighting with with my kids over the ketchup and with barbecue sauce as well. And because uh, I knew how much sugar was in those products. And uh, I knew that I could probably make this work because, you know, I grew up cooking in my house with my mom as the oldest child, always helping out in the kitchen. And one of the earliest things she taught me to cook was pasta sauce on the uh, Southern Italian. She's Sicilian. And she taught me to cook pasta sauce really early. And we always used carrot as a natural sweetener. And my mom always said, you lazy Italians use sugar. So we never used sugar in any of our cooking at home. And <clears throat> so I was looking at it and realized that, you know, a, that's the way, if you look across a lot of different cuisines, that's the way people used to use to sweeten soups and sauces and things like this. It was always like carrots or some type of squash or something or an apple to sweeten these products. And then, you know, as sugar got cheap, it replaced uh, these uh, fruits and vegetables. So <clears throat> that's how we got the idea. And so I knew it would kind of work, and luckily it did. How do you, uh, did you just get a blender and start making stuff? I mean, did you make a bunch of terrible tasting prototypes? I mean, how long did it take you to come up with something that passes the five-year-old test? Yeah, we had a, we had a bunch of terrible different prototypes. Like I said, my co-founder had tried to start this before, and he had, he had failed miserably, and uh, his products were awful. Um, so I had us do, because I knew... When you're cooking sauces, luckily I had a little bit of experience in the food industry when I started this. And uh, so I knew what we needed to do was get into a co-packer, somebody with industrial-sized kettles, small kettles, but it's still industrial kettles, because the, the difference between doing something like this, like a sauce on your stove, and doing it in a uh, facility is pretty significant. So you want to make sure you have a scalable recipe. So we just basically we went to this co-packer, and we took the idea with the recipes, the vegetables, and we just kept increasing the veggies and decreasing the sugars until we got to a point where it was really starting to not uh, taste like ketchup anymore. And then we kind of adjusted it back and just kind of played with that sugar level right there. And luckily, you know, that was that was our first product where we got down to 50% less sugar, which is still out there. Wow. Um, and then uh, once we were able to uh, raise a little bit of money, I hired a food scientist um, as a consultant. And because she has a lab, like we can test recipes out there things like that and so that helps a lot makes a big difference so how did you uh uh well, well explain for the explain to the listeners out there that don't know what what is a co-packer oh yeah so what's great about the food industry in the u.s is when you're starting a food company there are all these um what you call co-manufacturers or co-packers um co-man for short is uh, there's a bunch of these industries, these uh, companies that they do, they do nothing but produce other people's products for them. So they usually, sometimes they produce some of their own products, um, but for the most part, a lot of them, they find that it's just a lot easier and better for them. And uh, if you own a warehouse and you own a facility, you, it's just easier to produce other people's stuff. Um, now, it's <clears throat> no turnkey solution. You still have to work with them really closely. You've got to stay on top of them. You've got to make sure that the incentives are aligned. You've got to make sure that they, you know, they, they treat you right and that they keep to keep your recipe honest, things like this. Um, but uh, you got to find a good partner. Uh, but there are a lot of them out there, and there's more growing. Uh, there needs to be more. There's a huge demand for it, um, as the, uh, you know, especially in better-for-you spaces and food are booming right now. So everybody's starting new companies and looking for more production. So, so yeah, even some of the big companies have started using Coleman. So how did you find your co-packer? Did you just cold call a whole bunch of different uh, uh, options there, or did you uh, have a referral from somebody? Yeah, so the very first one we found uh, was in upstate New York. And I did that by – we joined the Specialty Food Association. So I joined the Specialty Food Association early on, SFA. And they had a list of co-men by state um, based on the type of product you were looking for. Uh, it wasn't always a great list. It was sometimes out of date. But, yeah, basically I kept calling down until I found a good fit. Um, found three or four that looked like good fits and then kind of visited those facilities um, and made the decision to go with that, that one. And then, you know, we kind of it's something that you're always kind of looking for a new or a better co-packer. If you're, if you're growing, there's always going to be outgrowing or smaller ones. Uh, or if you're 
lucky, you can find a great one that will take you on and you can grow with them. How, but it's, uh, how yeah. did you get in into stores? Because right now, from what I could tell um, after having uh, researched you guys, I mean, you have – 410 Walmart locations that you're you're in. I mean, you mentioned Sprouts. Uh, 12 I, 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 sorry. 1,200 Walmart. <laughs> tw- you, did you say 1,200? 1,200 Walmart, yeah. And I, uh, Devin, I'm not sure if you'd agree with me on this, but uh, I believe 1,200 is a larger number than 410. I, I did go to college uh, for mathematics, and I believe that's accurate. Okay, there we go. So you're in 1,200 Walmart stores. How did? You, what was the process like of getting your product into stores? Because so many entrepreneurs out there have a quote unquote good product that people like that they have a prototype for, but they don't end up in 1,200 Walmart stores and Sprouts and all these kind of things. How did you get in the stores? Yeah, so you start out small. Um, Clearly, like if you're when you're first getting started, you start out with local stores, uh, and a lot of some even some of the bigger stores, even Kroger has like a local program for you know local stores uh, for a metro market or for a state. Um, so try to find those, and if you can find usually your state's agricultural association um, or you know agri department or um, commerce department will have links and help you set up meetings that's kind of like if you're so say if you're in atlanta and you want to try to get in the public public might have a, a local program just for atlanta which will get you into the you know the stores around there um it's getting a little bit harder uh because it used to be it used to be the the key way like if you're in 2010 2012 if you were starting a natural or better for your company you could just go to your local whole foods pitch the idea get into your one whole foods and then you know just kind of keep growing from there Whole Foods has changed, you know, recently in the past few years. It's not as easy to get in anymore. They don't really take on um, a lot of local companies anymore either. So it takes a lot longer to get into Whole Foods. It's not as easy. Um, but basically, you, you know, you want to start small, um, start local, um, stay within your region so you can support your own stores. Um, and then, you know, as you grow up, you're going to be able to find, you'll, you'll figure out the system, you'll figure out the category reviews, you'll understand how to contact the buyers. As you get bigger, you'll, you'll be able to hire a broker who should be able to help with getting meetings, setting things up and stuff. And, uh, you know, you'll learn the, you know, learn the industry and learn um, the contacts of who the different buyers are at the different stores and when their review cycles are and when you can set up meetings with them. Do you, uh, with the terms with these stores, are they doing a, a net 30 or a net 90? Because I don't think a lot of people realize that. I don't think a lot of entrepreneurs are aware that most retailers, you know, they don't pay you the same day that your product sells. Can you kind of explain how that works for somebody out there who's listening, who's not aware of how the process of actually getting paid works? Yeah, it's one thing to really consider when you're getting started is looking at, especially when you're considering going e-commerce versus in store. You know, e-commerce, anytime you're on e-commerce, even on Amazon, your your sales are almost immediate, right? You're, you're capturing that dollar, that, those dollars right away. Um, where anytime you're going through stores, it's, it's a much further, you're so much further from the, the actual sale, especially it's further from the consumer. So not only are you just not getting paid by the store, but you're actually usually going through a distributor once you get big enough. Um, so you're going through the, the distributor, and then the distributor sells to the store. Um now, most contracts are a what they call a two percent uh, ten net thirty. So that means if the distributor pays you within ten days of receiving the invoice, they take two percent off the invoice. So it's something to consider right there. And then everything else is net thirty. And uh, now this is a big thing in our industry where you you really have to stay on top of them for the payments and pay attention to it because you know they'll say that they, they you'll send the invoice on the first of the month they'll say they received it on the 20th of the month they'll pay you on the 29th of the month and take two percent off so that happens a lot there's not always a lot you can do about it except for bitch and moan um <clears throat> it's one of those problems being a small company and a startup in this industry um but you so if you can plan for it that's the thing to do so if what advice would you have for a listener out there right now that uh, uh, aspires to be the next uh, true made foods and, and they have a product that actually tastes good. They've found a co-packer um, that's making it so they have that part nailed down. 
Um, as it relates to getting in those stores, would you recommend just, I mean, did you just pick up the phone and cold call people or did you email people or how did you get in those first a few small local stores? The first few small local stores, first off, you got to have a lot of product that you're willing to give away for free because um, everybody wants samples and everybody wants a free fill. Uh, free fill is the key term in the industry, which means uh, they want a free case of the product and uh, to get started because um, they don't want to, they don't want to take on the initial risk of buying it right away. Uh, and so usually you can walk into these stores and say, hey, listen, I'm going to give you a free fill. Let's see how the product sells. If it sells well, then you you know they'll start paying for products after that. Um, the challenge is, of course, that they sell the product. You got to stay on top of them, keep revisiting the stores, make sure that the product is selling, um, help it sell, doing demos or whatever you need to do, handing out coupons or helping out, um, creating awareness about around the product, and <clears throat> then also, you know, following up with the uh, retailing to make sure that they're reordered because they will completely forget to reorder too. So you have to stay on top of them. So, um, so that's why it's very important to start out locally and start out, you know, with neighborhood stores or things that are close to you that you can visit pretty easily on a regular basis. Um, that's always the easiest thing to do. Did you show up in person or did you pick up the phone and cold call the first few stores? I always showed up in person. The only reason you really want to cold call is to find out who's there. If you think about a store like or a restaurant or anything like that, that are very operationally intensive, people are running around. Um, you know, they're dealing with stuff out on the store floor. The managers aren't necessarily just sitting in an office and have time to talk on the phone, right, or check email. So the best way to do it is to grab them in person. So the only reason we really want to call is if you want to do a little bit of uh, recon and find out who the manager is, what his name is, his or her name is, and, like, what time they're usually in. So then when you drop in, you have a better chance of finding them. Or asking the person on the phone, hey, when's the best time to kind of drop in? When is it, you know, when is it least busy? Uh, typically, if you're dropping in on a store, you know, something like a Monday morning or something like that, you know, when it's not too busy, not a lot of customers in the store, that's the best time. If you come in with a lot of customers in the store, they're going to blow you off. They're not going to talk to you. So you need to be, you know, empathetic of what the uh, manager is going through, too. What, what would you say when you showed up? Did you just kind of knock on the door and say, hey, I'm a— uh, Brother Abraham here, and I've got some uh, life-changing uh, ketchup I want to talk to you about? Or what, what did you say? Yeah, pretty much. Listen, they're used to seeing new products. They're used to being picked new products all the time, depending on where you are and what kind of store manager it is. So, um, <clears throat> you know, especially if you're going to your local food co-op or natural store, something like that, they're probably used to seeing local products all the time. Uh, they may give you advice about, like, you know, what to do. There's going to be some pushback if you're not in distribution already. Very, you know, you want so you want to find the ones that are willing to take on and work with you directly for your early stores, uh, and that that may mean you know connecting in with other food entrepreneurs in your region, and so that they can give you some advice about which are the best stores to go start with. Uh, you know, like here in Washington D.C., like Glen's Garden Market uh, and Dupont Circle. Is a fantastic store to start in. They love supporting local entrepreneurs. They do a great job with it. And, you know, it's a great place to help, you know, get your name out and make recognition out for your, for your brand. So D.C. is where you call home? Yeah, D.C. I'm in Northern Virginia. I live in Northern Virginia now. Now, you, this is a family-owned company, if I'm correct. So I think you and your wife, you guys work together. Am, am I correct there? Uh, no, I mean, it is, it's my company. Um, you know, my wife puts up with me. Okay, I, I respect that. I would, uh, I would explain it that way. Yeah. So you now, how are you raising money, or how did you raise money to to scale it? What what, is, what does that look like? What's the method that you went through to raise money? <clears throat> well, you want to start. Early. What we got, like what I did is I um, I went through an accelerator to help launch this company. Um, that that's not always going to be an easy way to do it right when you started. We got I got lucky in that there was a new um, food accelerator starting in uh, New York at the time that we joined when we first launched. Uh, we didn't have anything but an idea, and because this was a new accelerator and they didn't know what they were doing, they they let us in. So we got lucky. Um, typically, with the you know these start startup food accelerators, they want to see a little bit of traction. They want to see some growth um, before they let you in. Uh, these food accelerators, though, you know, they'll give you something like fifty. They give us fifty thousand dollars initial investment and of course they connected us with other investors too who are interested in the space 
and that was key because as uh, I was a former Navy pilot, um, I had lived overseas after getting on the Navy for eight years. So I was, you know, used to working in emerging markets. I didn't really have an investor network, and not having an investor network can be a killer when you're starting a new company. Um, it's very hard to find early stage investors in food uh, and in depending on your region too. Like like Washington D.C. for example, here there's a lot of investor networks here, but you know nobody invests in food. They're investing in you know the bigger areas of the industry here, like cybersecurity, things like that. So you know if you're in a great place like Boulder or Austin that have kind of thriving food scenes, or uh, you know Santa Monica, parts of the Los Angeles. There are a lot more local investors there. Again, you want to get into the community. You want to talk to people. Um, you want to find uh, local networks. Like here in D.C., we have Union Kitchen and the Mess Hall, which are incubators, uh, you know, kind of shared kitchens, and they have a ton of resources, and they know who the investors are in the area and can help you know, connect you and tell you when you, and they can help you tell you when they're ready, if you're ready for investment, too, if your company is ready, if the investors will be interested in you. Um, you know, so finding those kind of networks in your area to help connect you is key. How did you find the time? I, I get asked this all the time from people who are new to entrepreneurship. How did you find the time to invest in your startup while also managing the demands of your family? Yeah, I mean, you kind of have to be stupid about it, right? It, uh, <laughs> to put it bluntly, yeah, you you go in. Um, one, you know, when you're first starting, if you're smart about it, you'll, you know, you'll keep your day job for a little bit while you work on this and you're just going to have to carve out time, um, from the rest of the week to be able to work on it. Um, I kind of went into this full force right away because I was, uh, I had just been laid off from my last job. It worked for a charity and it ran out of money. Um, so I, you know, kind of went in, uh, with a, with a crazy attitude you know, that I want to get this done. Um, I think what you have to do with the family is like you basically end up giving up everything else. Um, you know, I've got work and I've got my family and I, you know, I, and I carve out some time early in the morning to work True. out. Yep. And that's about it. Um, you know, we don't see friends that often. Um, I definitely don't have any hobbies, and uh, <laughs> I couldn't tell you what's I couldn't tell you what's going on in the news. What, what, so. what time? What time do you wake up? Like, what 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 does the first four hours of a, of a typical day look like for you? Uh, typically, I wake up you know just before five a.m., like four fifty, four forty-five, and I uh, I go right to the gym and uh, try to make it home by six thirty. And <clears throat> my wife leaves for work at six thirty a.m. and so. Usually I uh, make breakfast for the kids and get the kids up, and then the au pair takes over around 7.30, and that's when I start work. So let's talk about the, the, the future of, of the company now. Um, you're in 1,200 Walmart stores. Um, you're in Sprouts. How many, do you know how many Sprouts stores you're in? Uh, we're in all of them, so I think they're up to 320, 325. Oh, this is so cool. I'm going to go there tonight to buy some of that sriracha. <laughs> okay, uh, what, what other stores are you in? Uh, we see we are, like I said, we're in Wegman, we're in Safeway East out here in the D.C. area, a giant uh, stop and shop, uh, shop right, <clears throat> wait for Tops Market. And in the Midwest, we're in Mariano's in Chicago area, um, as well as uh, Festival, Sendix, and uh, Woodman's over in Wisconsin. Um, and uh, a spattering, and we're in Central Market in Dallas area as well, Sprouts. There. Yeah. Um, in California, we're in uh, Lassen's, uh, Sprouts, um, and Gelson's. So. And uh, so as you fund this thing, uh, I'm not going to ask you, you know, how much uh, revenue you're making or anything that would paint you into a corner, but are you to a place now where it's no longer scary, or does it still feel scary at times? No, it's definitely still scary. Um, so that's kind of <laughs> challenge is really, <laughs> you think about it, um, yeah, you're really when you're doing a, a consumer product like this, especially something low cost like ketchup or barbecue sauce. Yeah, you're really only, you're making sense in you know C E N T M. You're making sense. You're making your gross profit is you know fifty cents right per bottle or something like that. Um, and you're losing a lot of that to uh, you know promotions and marketing to in store to you know, drive those initial sales. So yeah, your gross profit is nothing. 
and you need to, uh, and it's a scale business, it's a volume business, right? Nobody's going to make money selling a thousand bottles of cash a year, right? You, you need to get to millions. And so you need to scale, you need to scale fast, and that's why you need investment typically. You need investment or a lot of patience and a lot of time. And, and that means you need to start talking on, you know, when do you break even? Well, you know, for a category like mine, there's the potential to break even at, you know, $5 million in annual sales. Um, but if we keep up a really strong growth um, trajectory and we start launching new SKUs and investing in the company that way, then, you know, we might, you know, may not break even or get to an EV dot positive until we're at like 10 million in sales. Um, if you're doing a beverage or a salty snack, which are, easier products to launch early because they're fast return and you get so it's a lot more dollar sales per store that you're in um <clears throat> it's easier to scale up in that first five ten million dollars in, in sales um but you're not looking at a break even until you get to 50 maybe even 100 million dollars in sales because the um uh, it's such a competitive market place where you're you know you're competing in that grab and go if you're competing in that grab and go beverage um uh, refrigerator right there on the front of the store, yeah. which is a cut, cutthroat place to be. Um, and you're competing against all these big players with lots and lots of money. You're, you know, you have to spend money on merchandising. You got to spend money on promotions, constant promotions. We're practically giving away the product early on to stay on that shelf and keep that place. Um, and you've got to spend money on people going to the store, making sure that other people are moving the product around. Things like this. So, you know. So there's always these give and takes, and uh, that's why it's really important to kind of start to figure out the economics of your particular category within your industry very early um, as you're getting started. So you can have realistic expectations of when, you know, you think this is going to be a um, steady state business. Why, um, I guess not why, but what is the profit margin? Like, Let's just say that I'm not asking for your margins, but let's just say that I have a, a product that I want to sell to Walmart, and I think it should retail, that the price that the consumer should pay should be $3. How much does a, uh, does the actual original manufacturer of this product, how much does a guy like you have, have to charge? And then talk to us about the markup layer, because I don't think people realize all the different markups that are going on. Yeah, that's the biggest complication and big surprise to a lot of people when they're first getting started in this case. Because if you... Um, so Walmart's a little bit easier because sometimes you can go direct to Walmart and um, Walmart takes actually a really low uh, um, gross margin. They'll, they'll take 25% sometimes. Um, <clears throat> but the average grocery store makes a 40% gross margin on every product that sells in the grocery section. And, uh, you know, Whole Foods and a lot of the other natural stores, they make, you know, 42, 43%, especially on a new item. They're going to want maybe even 45 percent. So you can imagine what that does to your price, right? Um, and now, if you're using a distributor to get to them, there's a whole other level right there because the distributor is going to also needs to make, you know, 15 to 25 percent um, on that as well. And they'll be marking it up 15 to 25, sometimes 30 percent because there's uh, distributors that, that do DSD, which is uh, direct service delivery, and they, you know, the distributor stocks the shelf. So they charge the store more, so they mark up your product more. So it'll be marked up 30 to 40 percent sometimes. So there's a lot of building right there. So you're looking at giving away, say, if your product is selling for three dollars, <throat> you know, you're giving away probably almost two dollars of that to the distributor and the retailer. Wow. Uh, um, as you're going in, you need to be prepared for that, and you need to, um, you know, at least a dollar fifty. And you need to be prepared for that. You need to do the calculus on that. You know, have the spreadsheets out running that uh, to see what's going to happen. Um, but your gross margin, a, a healthy gross margin that you should be targeting or, or shooting for and to have a path to is to get above a 40% gross margin. Um, yeah, again, if you are a higher velocity product or that's more competitive area like a salty snack or a beverage, especially grab and go beverage, you know, you need to be above 50% or even higher because you're, again, on promotion all the time to compete on the shelf. So you're always doing sales, doing coupons, that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, even in a regular grocery area, like a boring category like ketchup, we need to be at, you know, a 40, above 40% 40 gross margin is healthy. And then, you know, if you can get to 45 or so, then, you know, that's ideal. So you're saying, like, if, if somebody out there has, has as, as a food product and it costs them a dollar per unit to make, 
they need to be plan they need to plan on on charging a dollar forty for that to, to to the actual retail stores. Yeah, I mean that's a markup. I think if you did the math math for a gross margin, it would be a little bit more. Um, but the uh, yeah, basically. Okay. Uh, okay. That makes yeah. sense. I'm trying to break it down for the, the listeners now. I have a, a three final questions for you because I totally respect your time. Um, I want to just three final questions, um, kind of lightning around here. Um, a lot of the people we've had on the show, um, you know, whether it be the founder of Honest Tea, uh, we had him on the show. And this guy, I mean, he went through just absolute hell and back. I mean, to, to build his uh, Seth Goldman to build Honest That's Tea. Um, and now he's doing the Beyond Meat or or a guy Kawasaki or a, or a Wolfgang Puck. They all they all have like an idiosyncrasy that it actually is like a superpower. To most it looks like an idiosyncrasy or something kind of weird, but it ends up being their superpower. You know, Steve Jobs wore the same thing every day. Uh, guy Kawasaki likes to learn a new skill all the time. He likes to go surfing all the time to kind of clear his head. Um talk to me. What what is an idiosyncrasy that you have that you, you maybe perceive to be a superpower? Uh, I, I can turn off the ego pretty quickly. So this is maybe part of being going through Navy flight school where they're yelling at you all the time. Um, like you're going to hear no so much and, uh, people are going to be telling you that you can't do it. And you're going to, you're going to deal with the pettiest, the stupidest things constantly that are people just screwing up. You're going to deal with investors who are asking all kinds of ridiculous questions and, you know, questioning everything about you, and you need to be able to just put up with a lot of that stuff, um, especially in the food industry, things like this. If you're, and you're talking to grocery buyers and who are just going to poo-poo you and blow you off. Um, you need to be able to, like, check your ego at the door and just kind of keep coming at it. So um, you can't let little things get upset, upset you constantly. Just go stay focused on the big picture. Don't let the little things upset you. That is just awesome, awesome advice. Does it take you about two seconds to get over a rejection now? I mean, when you get someone tells you no, are you like, okay, or does it take you two minutes or two weeks? Or how long does it take you? I mean, is, it, is, it, is it two years? Is it, is it a dark place? It's not, it's not a dark place. It depends on the rejection, right? Okay. Uh, so, but no, yeah, I usually don't get things built up. So, and I always have multiple contingency plans because then I almost expect a no. So when the, the yes comes through, it's much better. Um, you know, so I almost plan around the no. So, you know, try to lock in the yes. Uh, this is so but, Yeah, we get. <laughs> but, yeah, no, I can usually get over it pretty quickly, usually two minutes or so. I absolutely love this. This this interview here is one of my highlights. I absolutely, This is just so much. If you're listening right now, and you're hearing this kind of knowledge. This is the knowledge you do not get in college. And whether it's working with a client like the Grill Gun to help them get their product, their product in stores back in the day, or uh, working or seeing my friend Lori Montag get her zany bands into big box retail stores, and she sold sixty million dollars of those zany bands. You know those bracelets in the shape, the rubber band bracelets in the shape of pirate ships and that kind of stuff. This is the kind of stuff that. I would hear from these people that you don't hear anywhere else. So you need to listen to this show twice. If you're out there listening today, listen to this show twice, take notes. It's so good. Um, what is a book or a couple of books that you would recommend for all of our listeners as it relates to um, getting your products into stores or maybe the mindset you've learned? Is there, is there a book or two you'd recommend for our listeners? Uh, there's a new one that's just come out um, called Ramping Your Brand. It's literally just launched. Um, I know the author. He's a great guy. He's one of the few people in this industry who actually uses a lot of data um, behind you know, research. Everybody's got opinions in this industry. Not very many people use data or use data smartly. And so he's got, he's got great stuff out there. Um, it's uh, Ramping Your Brand by, of course, now I'm blanking his name. It's, uh, I'm, go um, I'm going to Amazon right now. You said Ramping Your Brand. Pull it up right now. Uh, would this be by James F. Richardson, Ph.D.? That is him. Okay. And, Devin, let's put a link to it on the, on the show notes so all of our listeners can easily find it. Um, my final question for you, what advice would you give your uh, younger self? I mean, because you, you – you, how long were you working on this project before you actually sold anything? Uh, you know, we, we actually – we have a weird story because I, I dove into this full force like in 2014, 2015. Um, 
we we actually sold pretty quickly. Like we walked into, we we ramped it up really fast. Walked into the fancy food show, had a booth at the fancy food show in June 2014, and uh, no, yeah, 2015. Sorry, June 2015. And we never sold a product and walked out with ten thousand dollars in POs in that first day. Wow! And uh, after the, after that, I was obsessed. You know, like, um, I think the biggest mistake I made early on was thinking that I could scale this thing overnight. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I jumped in, was way too excited, way too enthusiastic. And you know, again, I can not sleep and just build something nonstop. And that's what I did for the first year. And actually, that was. I should have gone slower. I should have taken my time more um, because we just, I scaled it too fast, almost killed the company because, you know, we ended up, you know, pushing, you know, not getting the labels right, not mm. waiting until we really had the perfect product um, and getting into the, some of the, not really learning the industry enough, using a bad broker, getting into the wrong stores and, uh, you know, ended up getting kicked out and waste, get, wasted a lot of money. And, uh, almost killed the company and uh, wow. you know, I had a, I, I had a bad co-founder too early on. I jumped in with the co-founder thinking, you know, I just wanted somebody to work with and uh, I was working so hard and so fast that, you know, that I missed some things that were, you know, key indicators that this person was not a good person to work with. And, uh, you know, having to kick your co-founder out too after a year is, it can also kill it, almost kill the company. So we had to kind of reset, <clears throat> and revamp and kind of it's really only been like the last two and a half years that the company's really taken off and we think they're really starting to click is the fancy food show that that's an actual name of a big trade show yeah the uh the big trade shows there's the fancy food show there's one in new york in june and one in uh, uh san francisco in january and then there's a natural product expo east on the east coast and natural product expo west on in uh, Anaheim, California, every year in March, and uh, but, uh, those four shows are kind of the four big shows in the industry, um, trade shows, which are great ways to get exposure and do your brand. They're really expensive, um, <clears throat> so I, I wouldn't recommend doing them until you're really kind of a little bit more. We had a great luck at doing the fancy food show right away, right at the beginning, but you know I wouldn't always recommend doing them right away. There's other ways to test your product. Now it's much easier to test your product out to test your see what kind of demand you get it online by setting up an Amazon account, doing it that way. It's a lot less, uh, less cost intensive, uh, a lot less risk, and uh, you can test a lot more to see how much more direct consumer brand, you know, demand you have. So there's and then a, when you're really ready to scale, start doing the shows. So there's a, a fancy food show in New York and then one in Austin, is that correct? Yes, yeah, sorry, San Francisco. Oh, San Francisco. And then there is the, the other one is the Natural Product Expo, is that correct? Yeah, Natural Product Expo. Cool. You you know, you are a wealth of knowledge, and your website's looking good. I unfortunately see a lot of entrepreneurs that have great products and hideous websites. You know what I mean? Where the product is good, but the website right. looks hood. How long How long have you spent on this website? This looks gorgeous. This this uh, truemadefoods.com, T-R-U-E, truemadefoods.com. I mean, how long did it take you to build this beautiful thing? I really appreciate that. Um but, yeah, I mean, we changed the website multiple times. I mean, luckily I had a lot of experience with uh, WordPress prior to this, yeah. building, my, building sites myself, and uh, yeah, I'd even launched a few sites in PHP. When you're doing a food product, really your, your website is a billboard more than anything else, an information site. doesn't need a lot of interactive, and you, don't, and you want something that's secure and that's easy, and easy to maintain right? and easy to design. And then also, you know, when you're ready, you know, get a good designer. You know, find a good designer and uh, spend the time and the effort to work with them um, because it makes a big difference. We've been through a couple of different designers and uh, now we're redesigning again. But uh, I mean, I think that makes a big difference. I mean, well, at least, at least, at least, at least, as you go through each designer, at least they're expensive. We can hang our head on that. At least we're creating jobs for yeah. for yeah. people. <laughs> I mean, at least, I mean, some of these designers. I'm not asking you to share how much you spend on them, but I mean, some of these designers can set you back. You know, dozens of thousands of dollars. I mean, I've I've heard people coming in here uh, for some business coaching after they're you know a hundred thousand dollars, one hundred twenty thousand dollars deep into a website and graphic design, and they're still not happy with it. Yeah, I think. I mean, it, it can be dangerous. I'd be very. Um, I would not spend that much almost ever until you're a Fortune five hundred company uh, on design, or unless it's you know you, you're the designer you're working with better come highly recommended from people you really trust. Uh, 
And again, I think that one of the problems with working with a designer is you really don't know what they're going to do for you until you actually start working with them. Right. So it's key to kind of, again, ask around and find people that you trust who really recommend to somebody. You have been, uh, seriously, I, we've had now, uh, I don't want to make up a number here. Let me pull it up real quick. On the show, I just want to read this off so that way I'm making sure I'm making an accurate uh, a statement here. But so far on, on, the, on the Thrive Time show, we have done a total of um, 1,830 shows. And we've had, you know, everybody wow. from Seth Godin on here to uh, David Robinson to, you know, all these big, big folks. This right here, my opinion, it's been the most practical show we've ever done. So I, I don't know if you if you need a round of applause, but uh, I would say great job that right there. I'm telling you, that right this right here sets the record, and therefore you get a mega point, which is redeemable at Sprouts, I believe, for a discount on some of your uh, sugar free sriracha. Thanks so much. I really appreciate that. Hey man, that's really nice. Spin. No, seriously, I, I I appreciate you so much, and I hope you have a a great um, rest of your uh, evening. Well, it's been awesome. And happy New Year. Hope you have a good one. Thrive Nation, I am fired up. And I don't know what it is, but I feel like there's somebody listening right now to this show who is going to have their life changed as a result of what you have just learned. Because you now know the proven steps that you need to take in order to turn your idea into reality. I remember when I was at the dresser, Mansion. It's a it's a wedding facility in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I was at, I was at the Dresser Mansion in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Everybody, look it up. Dresser D R E S S E R. The Dresser Mansion in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I was. Uh, this is about two years before I sold DJConnection.com. And one of my good friends, Lori Montag, always told me that one day she would become a multi millionaire. And her name is Lori Montag. L O R I. Montag, M-O-N-T-A-G. Her son and I were best friends growing up, and during the summers, I used to travel down from Minnesota to Oklahoma to stay with the Montag family during the summers. And Lori always told me that one day she would be a multi-millionaire. Well, long story short, she created this product called the Slap Watch. A lot of you have seen it. Maybe some of you have owned the Slap Watch. It's S-L-A-P, Slap Watch, the Slap Watch, or you might have seen uh, her product there called the Zany Bands. They're like the rubber bands that, that kids used to wear in the shape of pirate ships or different things like that. Anyway, Lori invented the Slap Watch and the Zany Bands. And through just diligence and perseverance and implementing the specific moves that you just learned about on today's show, these exact same moves that you just learned, she was able to get her product the slap watch onto the view and some of you probably even saw this show and then i love these this is a watch you can give them to anybody in the family these are called the slap watch demonstrate these are only they come in every color the face comes out they're 17.95 each so you could buy slap me barbara you just just slap watch us. look at that And then using these same moves, uh, using the Dream 100 moves that we talk about, we have so many shows about the Dream 100 system created by Chet Holmes, but it just just do a Google search for Thrive Time Show Dream 100, and you can find the the shows about Chet Holmes and the, and the Dream 100 system. But as a result of implementing the proven moves, Lori then got her product, the Slap Watch, featured on The Ellen Show. All right, here's something else I, I found that is actually really, really cool. These things, have you seen these things? These are called a slap watch. And what you do, because sometimes you don't have time to buckle a watch on, you just got to go and you just do that. And then it just gets right put on your hand like that. Isn't that cool? And it comes in nine colors and they have removable, removable faces. So you can mix and match. So it's nine co colors and then uh, 81 possibilities. And the coolest thing is uh, all of you are getting all nine of them. <laughs> Well, Lori went on to sell over $60 million of products. Over $60 million of products. And it's not because she's the smartest person in the world, although she is very smart. It's because she decided to become a diligent doer and an implementer of the systems 
that she was learning. She implemented the proven systems, and you can too. That's what this show is about. This show is about diligently implementing the proven systems that we teach on a daily basis. Thomas Edison, who could not be here today because he is dead, said that vision without execution is hallucination. So stop hallucinating and take some action. Come on, baby. Reach out today. Book your tickets to attend our in-person Thrive Time Show workshop or schedule a one-on-one consultation with myself. But do not be a bystander. Do not be somebody who just looks at other people's, other people's success with envy. Be somebody who has decided to participate in the conversation about how to dramatically increase your compensation. My name is Clay Clark, and I would humbly ask that you would join me in ending today's show with a boom, because boom stands for big, overwhelming, optimistic momentum. And that's what it's going to take to make the amount of money that you want to make. But don't spiritualize this idea of becoming successful. Don't emotionalize it. Don't make it weird. It's a linear path. It's step one plus step two plus step three. That's what you have to do. And uh, T.D. Jakes, my favorite uh, minister, he just gave a sermon called It's Not for Sale, which you can watch on YouTube. It's Not for Sale by Bishop T.D. Jakes. It just came out December 29th of 2019. And I want you to hear what he has to say about what happens when people try to make the path to success overly complicated and overly spiritual as opposed to as, as opposed to being linear and step by step. When people try to remove the laws of cause and effect from becoming successful and they try to replace it with with luck, with superstition and random feelings of pseudo spirituality. Our mentality is we need a miracle. I'm believing God for a car. I'm believing God for a house. I'm believing God for a coat. I'm believing God for a house. I'm believing God to send my kids to private school. I hate to tell you this. There are atheists that send their kids to private school. There are drug dealers that have a car. That's not a miracle. You don't need God. You need a good job. You need to come to work. You need to save your money. You can get you a car. You don't need to call on heaven and provoke the angels to get a car. That magical mentality is killing the church. We are asking God for stuff that we can do ourselves. Oh, God, help me. If you want a proven path to business success, we have the proven playbook. My partner, Dr. Robert Zellner, and I have been able to build 16 multi-million dollar companies because we know that today is the day that you can learn these proven systems. We know the proven systems. We know we can teach them to you. We know you can implement them, but nothing works unless you do. So I would ask you this today. What is stopping you from choosing to have success? Success is a choice. A choice to make the trade-offs, a choice to get up early, a a choice to, to skip lunch, to hit the deadline, a choice to push through fear, a choice to work on the weekend and to get ahead, a choice to turn off the TV and to open a book, a choice to hold yourself accountable, a choice to hold others accountable. Success is the choice that I make every single day. What is keeping you, my friend, what is keeping you from deciding to be successful today. So when we wrap up this show and we bring the boom, the big, overwhelming, optimistic momentum, when we bring that big, overwhelming, optimistic momentum, I would ask you, what is stopping this from being your day where you will turn your dream life into reality? What is standing in the way of you just barely surviving? And what is keeping you from thriving? It's time for you to take action, whether it's to attend a conference, whether it's to become a one-on-one coaching client, whether it is to subscribe to our online school. Today is your day to thrive. And now without any further ado, three, two, one, boom. Hey, how's it going? I'm Thomas Crossan, uh, owner and founder of Full Package Media in Dallas, Texas. Uh, I've been a coaching client with Clay Clark since the beginning of our business. Um, we started about a year ago, August of last year, 
I had no clients, no idea what we were doing, no clue uh, really what was going on. And now we've grown to where we've got six photographers, uh, we've got office space here. Um, I have an admin sales person that works for us full time, uh, developing an online system. And a lot of that growth we attribute to Clay helping us. And there's so many things that, not, I mean, his stuff is not you know revolutionary. It's not this crazy walk on hot coals and all this stuff. Uh, it's just real, real stuff and like group interviews. We were totally against group interviews. Uh, we were like, no, we're different and we're we're special and we need to, you know, do one on one interviews so we can find good quality candidates and and not just kind of do this group interview thing. And uh, we tried that and failed miserably. Uh, we did group interviews. Now we do them every two weeks, uh, and it's it it's awesome. It works good. We always have kind of an influx of new people that we can train, get going. Um, He's helped us a lot with our website, um, graphic design, SEO. Um, SEO is another thing that I thought before I started this business and before Clay that was it was kind of a, a joke or you know something that only your apples of the world and Amazon could get to the top of, the, of Google. Um, but Clay said, no, just do these things, um, follow these steps, and you'll get there. And I think now we've looked today and we're uh, number two for Dallas Real Estate Photography. If you don't believe me, you can look. Uh, so we're getting to the top of there. That's really cool. It's, it's really awesome to get leads that people will call you and say, hey, I found you on Google. Um, you know, we want to hear about your services. So that's really great. Um, I'd say there's nobody out there that's not a good uh, coaching client for Clay. Uh, I mean, you're it's anyone, regardless of the business, it's not about what the business is, what the specialty is. It's about following the steps, um, doing what he says, uh, you know, it's, it's a good thing, an hour a week, it, it gets you on track and keeps you kind of in line of what you're doing and what you shouldn't be doing. <laughs> um, and it's good to kind of give you some flow and future goals of your business. And I remember our first meeting, we set our goals and our goal was to do 16 shoots a week. Um, and at the time, me and my business partner slash girlfriend Gretchen were like, oh, that's, we're never gonna do 16 a week. That's just like crazy. Uh, and Today we're doing nine, uh, and we did about 54 last week. So uh, he's helped us grow. You know, we've put in a lot of hours, a lot of hard work as well. But if you follow his steps and do what he do what he says, there's a lot of principles that he's kind of taught and still in us uh, that help us. So uh, yeah, Clay Clark, he's the way to go. I, I want to venture out to find someone else. They'd be more expensive and. A lot more fluff and no no real actionable work and things to get your business growing so uh, that's the way to go thanks